it's exactly 12 o'clock mountain time, which means it's exactly two o'clock on the East Coast. And as we're letting a few people join us, we have a stacked agenda for the things that we're talking about today. So I don't want to waste a millisecond as we are getting started. Folks are continuing to join us, um, which is awesome. And we're going to get started. I'm Eva Goldborn, um, CEO and founder of Littlefoot Ventures. And I am joined by an absolute unbelievable panel for us to discuss exploring child nutrition policy in school food systems. And um, at the top of my screen, I have Chef Ann Cooper, who is the founder, the OG of the school nutrition space, truly um, a champion for many decades in this work with us. Um, I have Mara Fleischman, who is the CEO of the Chef Ann Foundation. Um, hi, Mara. And uh, 10 plus years with the foundation at this point, yet many decades um, of working in this space, formerly um, uh, Director of Global Partnerships for Whole Foods, so deeply integrated into this world. Um, also from the Chef Ann Foundation camp, I have MJ Kepner, who's our Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy, joining us as well. And then Emily Broadlieb, the woman, the myth, the legend of Harvard Food Law Policy Clinic, a leading um, voice and change maker within all things food policy, and in this case, all things school food, nutrition, and policy. So um, thank you all for joining us um, to have this conversation. I think as people are continuing to join us as well, it is a very timely discussion for us to be having on all things policy um, based on a lot of what's been going on in the space. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Also, um, just so everyone knows, this session is being recorded. We're going to be on here for about an hour. Our goal is to have about 40, 45 minutes of discussion amongst this high profile, amazing panel um, with the latest and greatest from their perspectives. And then we're going to do our best to accommodate several questions from you as the audience. Um, we have a ton of Chef Ann Foundation team members on hand. So if you want to add questions in the chat and in the, um, in the Q and A box, feel free to do so. If the questions are easy enough for our team to answer um, in the chat, then we will. And otherwise I'm gonna do my best to integrate a few of those juicy thoughts and questions towards the end of the discussion. Um, and rest assured, anything that we don't get to today um, since this is being recorded and the team has been working so hard on this webinar, we're, we're going to do our best to make sure that you have um, any write-ups or additional information that we can't touch on today. Because the truth matter is, like, this is just like the scratching the surface on um, what is relevant and going on. So with further, without further ado, Mara, I think as our fearless leader on the Chef Ann Foundation side, before we get started... I want to hear from you. Often as change makers, we're focused and rightly so on what needs to be fixed, especially when we're talking about government, especially when we're talking about policy. But I want to start on a positive note. What are some of the positive things that you're seeing in the school meal space right now? And what are you excited about in particular in the Chef and Foundation orbit that we can sort of begin in a, in a positive and um, action oriented conversation? Thank you, Eva. Uh, and thanks to our panelists for joining us and our attendees. It's exciting to see um, this much enthusiasm for school food policy. Woohoo. Um, I feel like it's a really exciting time in school food. I think anyone who's in school food knows it's an exciting time in school food. Uh, it's also an exciting time in food system, the greater food systems work right now, uh, generally speaking. Um, so some of the amazing things I have been seeing, uh, I think most people have been seeing over the last year plus in school food, um, I think first and foremost is the um, kind of entire food systems package that Secretary Vilsack uh, passed uh, with, you know, billions of dollars um, going out there to improve our food systems, our supply chains through healthy meal incentives and other initiatives. Um, it's probably one of, if not the most comprehensive package 
we have seen in the history to support the food system. And out of that, you know, the, you know, healthy meal incentive initiatives that are directly affecting change in school meals is something that, um, you know, we haven't seen uh, before healthy meal incentive one going towards, you know, uh, rural school districts, helping them to improve their school meals programs. And um, the second phase of healthy meal incentives really out there to help improve a more resilient food supply chain um, directed towards school, school food communities. Um, for me, that's been a game changer and kind of the level of partnership that a lot of us progressive advocates have had with the USDA. In addition, I feel like, you know, we have really seen the states take over a lot of the lift when it comes to progressive policy change in school food. You know, obviously, you know, healthy school meals for all moving forward and, you know, a number of states in our country led by California as the first uh, was huge. So many of us, you know, and for the longest time has been an advocate for universal free meals and to finally see the states just say, hey, you know, if the feds can't get there, we will, uh, has been an incredible um it's been incredible to just see how our country can work like that. In addition, some of the packages these states are passing as support components to healthy school meals for all has been really exciting to see. Um, in California, school food best practices, kitchen infrastructure funding, uh, in New Mexico, uh, scratch cooking and equipment funding um, that you know went along with their healthy school meals for all. Colorado originally had... Um, uh, funding for local procurement and for um, uh, labor support. So we're just seeing a lot of wraparound support with Healthy School Meals for All in the states. And I think it's really exciting to see each kind of state coalition working towards a lot of this change. That's great, Mara. And what a sort of awesome overview for us to and a little sneak peek into some of the conversation that we're going to have today, which I think people are especially keen on that state side as well. Um, but before we go into some of those amazing case studies and examples at the state level, Emily, to help us make sense in some degree, I mean, there's many, uh, you know, experts on the call already listening in, people who are in deeply in, in school food already, but I think it is, you know, a great opportunity for us to just do some sense making in terms of, can you break down the different roles for us in terms of the, how the federal government plays a role in child nutrition policy, because as we go through this conversation, we'll see some of it is, is functioning as it should, and some aspects of it are not functioning as it should, and that really sort of starts to have that trickle-down effect. So I'd love to hear from you just to frame us up. Sounds great, and thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here, and I think as Eva alluded to, we had, like, our prep calls were so much fun, so I'm really glad to have another hour together to keep chatting about these. Um, there's so much going on. It's it's kind of an exciting time. There's some, you know, kind of interesting things going on too. Um, but just maybe to frame a little, um, a couple big things. I think one big one is that um, a lot of school food starts with the federal government. And in part, that's because there's so much funding for school meals come through the um, national school lunch program, the school breakfast program, and then a bunch of like other side programs, like, you know, fresh fruit and vegetable program, or there's funding for, for through the child and adult care food program for, you know, preschools and daycare. So there's, that's where the lion's share of the money comes. And because the money comes from the federal government, they get to call the shots on a lot of the rules around like what are schools and other programs required to do to get that money. Um, and of course, as Mara mentioned, and we'll come back to like, states can go above and beyond that. They've always gone above and beyond. They can have like additional requirements for nutrition. They can put in more money. They can you know, support additional programming. And I think in some cases when states do that too, they like show the federal government what's possible. And those are like the incubators for change. Um, but just like zooming in on the federal role. So all of these, these rule, these, these, you know, programs start with Congress. Congress has the ultimate say in like appropriating money for things. And um, as probably a lot of people on this call know, the big legislation that's supposed to cover 
the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program is the Child Nutrition Reauthorization, um, which typically had happened every five years. And the last one happened 14 years ago in 2010 was the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. So, you know, that's typically where Congress like sets out an agenda for the next few years of what they want USDA to do and different requirements, new programs, like creating, you know, the farm to school program, which has been really popular. Um, mm -hmm. Any new programs like that really like generally have to be created by Congress. Um, and then they can kind of, you know, set task USDA with doing things. So a couple examples from the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act that USDA has continued to implement were updating the nutrition standards. So, you know, Congress said, we're giving all this money to school meals, we're serving 30 million meals a day, and USDA, we want you to update those standards. It has taken 14 years for USDA to update those standards. Um, but most of that really comes through child nutrition reauthorization. There's another really big bill in the food world, which is the farm bill. And I know we're going to talk more about it, I think, in a bit. But just to give a preview, um, that also typically happens every five years. Unlike CNR, it has generally stuck to that five to seven year schedule, although I think it's a little up in the air now. And it generally isn't the place where school meals are covered, although Congress can kind of do what Congress wants. And um, there, you know, there's some there's some things within that that impact school meals, like um, for example, geographic preference for school meals, allowing kind of authorizing schools to have a preference for local foods originally came through the farm bill. There's sometimes been things that have moved back and forth between farm bill and child nutrition reauthorization, like SNAP ed, um, which, you know, started, I think, in CNR and then moved to farm bill. Mm -hmm. um, and but generally that hasn't been the home for school meals, but we might be seeing that change and um, and seeing some things in the farm bill um, that that are related. That's that's a, a great overview, Emily, and, and thank you for that, because it also sounds like yeah, we're, we're 14 years delayed in, in a lot of the child nutrition reauthorization activities that we need, um, and then in turn making the farm bill a lot more um, valuable to us in terms of hoping for that to be a vessel of change. Um, which sounds like there are some provisions within that and a few um, that just won't sort of sit squarely within that. But the Farm Bill, at least there's a draft in the House and Senate, right? And so is there any, yeah, you know, so like we'll get the wins that we can get. Um, anything of particular interest or that you think is particularly encouraging for us um, that we can look out for um, in the Farm Bill, knowing that, you know, everything is not functioning as we might hope that it is, but we're going to take all the wins we can get. Yeah, so, and I mean, for those joining us, like if anyone's watching the Farm Bill, things are happening this week. So I was up at midnight last night looking at the text of the draft of the House Farm Bill, which, um, you know, I think just to start by saying we're already kind of a year behind. Um, we had a couple, last year we put out a whole bunch of reports saying like, what we want to see in the 2023 Farm Bill. Here we are in you know May of 2024, and um, Congress did pass a one year, um, you know, a one year kind of authorization for that last farm bill to continue. But they're feeling some pressure now to make something happen. Um, typically, the House farm bill passes first, and typically for the last few farm bills, the House and Senate have really different bills, and they've had to, you know, they go through a committee through the um, in the in the House it's the Ag Committee, and it, the Senate it's the um, Agriculture and Forestry Committee. Um, and then they have to go to a, like a conference committee where they work out the kinks. And this is no different. We've seen like two really different bills. The House is the only one where there's draft language now. So we know a lot more detail about what's in there. But there was a pretty detailed um, kind of like a, a very detailed outline put out by um, Senator Stabenow for what you know she would want to see in the Senate version. Um, so we have some sense. And, and as I said, I think they're really, really different, which which, you know, I don't know how that bodes for getting something passed, um, but just a couple of things of interest. I think on the Senate one, there's not a lot about school food. Again, you know, typically school meals have not been in the farm bill with the exception of, um, you know, a couple of funding streams that help like, like USDA buy extra commodity foods that then can flow to schools and things like that. Um, there were a lot of provisions in the Senate one around food waste and food recovery, which I'm really excited about because it's something we spend a lot of time on. One of the reports we did was was really about what should be in the next farm bill. And um, a lot of those elements were in there. For example, um, 
um, directing the Food Loss and Waste Reduction Liaison, which was a position created at USDA in the last Farm Bill, directing that liaison to do to work on a national food waste campaign. So we know, for example, a lot of waste happens in households, which is both has environmental impacts because wasted food has causes emissions and waste of resources, but also money. Like people are talking about inflation and food prices, but if people don't have a lot, a lot of awareness about where they're wasting and where they could actually have those dollars go further, uh, I think it, it can impact individuals. Um, it would, you know, you know, I don't want to get into so much, you know, a couple other things I'm really excited about, like another big one is there was a new pilot program created in the last farm bill to give money to cities to create compost and food waste reduction programs. And this would um, continue that and also expand the eligibility to states, which is something we've been pushing for because often, you know, cities can do a lot, but often there's a lot of places left out when that only can go to um, local government. Um, so those are like the, you know, the the Senate Farm Bill, I think is very much similar to a lot past farm bills we've seen. On the House side, I'm not gonna get into some of the bigger controversy of which there's a lot. And if you read about it a little bit, there's like some SNAP controversy and some um, conservation and kind of climate controversy. One thing I wanna point out that was interesting is that there are some provisions on schools in the House version, um, particularly um, related to milk. So there's a provision in there that would, um, uh, not include um, milk fat in saturated fat limits on meals. And also there's a provision that would prohibit the USDA from putting restrictions on milk, um, you know, in terms of not allowing flavored milk or not allowing full fat milk. There's also that's, provisions that's an that would- And Emily, that's an update yeah. that's literally happening in real time right now. Oh, in real time. Yes, I thank you. So, so the draft language came out Friday and there's going to be a committee markup tomorrow um, where, you know, the the Democrats and Republicans in the House Ag Committee will duke it out over, you know, about, over a bunch of provisions. So, I mean, I think to sum up here, you know, it's really timely. I think the big takeaway here is also that the fact that that Congress has been is willing to put these really specific, you know, school food provisions into the farm bill is really telling, I think, around maybe you know, they're also frustrated that they haven't been able to move CNR forward, just like many of us are. Um, but also it's it's a little worrying too, because I think it's out of line of where usually that um those decisions would be made. So lots to lots to unpack, a really interesting time to be watching. Thank you. I, I feel like we need um like ESPN to have like a new live uh, food bill watch session, um, just like we do for the NBA and whatnot, because it is exciting and it's literally happening and unfolding in front of us right now. Um, Chef Van, moving over to you, you know, Emily has given us this helpful overview and reminded us of this huge federal system and policy that happens sort of above the, you know, the proverbial uh, school plate. Give us a sense really and ground us from the perspective of the work that you do that really is centered around like in the cafeteria, in reality, and how have you seen the evolution of this child nutrition work um, in uh, on the ground? Well, I'd love to do that. Thank you everyone for being here. I do wanna comment on what Emily was just talking about with this milk thing, because I think what's really the most interesting is that some members of Congress are trying to go in a back door through the farm bill to regulate something that is in CNR. And in this case, the idea that they could actually change the 10% sat fat by allowing milk to have unlimited sat fat and not counting it, I think it is, is a little scary that that's how things could change at this point without going through CNR. But for me, you know, I've been doing this almost a quarter century now. And I remember when I first took my uh, first director position in, a, in California and I walked in on my first day of school and I opened the freezer and it was full of packaged ultra processed foods from corn dogs to grilled cheese sandwiches in packages to hamburgers already cooked on the bun in packages to, I mean, everything, everything was prepackaged in plastic, heated in the plastic, served in the plastic. Kids, you know, were being served food that was heated in plastic. And we know that plastic can migrate. 
So that was my first experience in school food in a, in a public school setting. And this was in Berkeley, California, which you would think wouldn't be necessarily serving that type of food. And if we go from school districts, even in places that we think of as maybe liberal bastions, I mean, Berkeley, Alice Waters, all that, to and they were serving this ultra processed foods to what we see today all over the country, whether in rural areas or urban areas, school food has made huge progress. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, of course, made a difference. It started putting food regulations in there. We got smart snacks. We got uh, whole grain requirements. I mean, things that were really, really important. And what we're seeing now is this big shift uh, towards people wanting healthier school food and not just in school food professionals. Many times the shift is coming from parents and advocates who are saying, that's not what we want to serve our kids anymore. So we started seeing people just making their own grilled cheese sandwiches or buying pizza crust and, and topping it with some less processed items. Started seeing people serving something as simple as pasta marinara and, you know, cooking the pasta from scratch, which is now whole grain rich and making their own pasta sauce. Uh, and, and this has come through scratch cooking. So when you decide you're going to move away from ultra processed foods, which has gotten all kinds of really negative press recently, big article in the New York Times about how bad it really is for us. Um, as we start taking baby steps away from that, to making our own food, that's where we get into scratch cooking, speed scratch and scratch, where we say, okay, we're going to start using whole ingredients. We're going to start using potentially raw uh, proteins, whole grains, whole, whole foods, you know, fresh fruits and, and fresh vegetables. We've seen, you know, in the last decade, salad bars become more and more and more popular. This is something that the Chef Anne Foundation worked for many years on. Uh, and continues to do so today. So we're seeing salad bars in schools all over the country. Um, and so I, I think we're seeing significant change in every demographic. And I think this is really, really exciting. I mean, the school food I see today in many schools across the country is really good. Hey, Anne, I just wanted to jump in because there's a question in the chat that I think you're right to answer. Um, and, and it's something you and I talk about frequently. So there is a question in the chat that says, um, you know, can scratch, can big ideas like scratch cooking really push school food forward? Um, is it a process where dreaming big even pushes low income schools into the right direction? Or is scratch cooking um, a great, uh, a great idea, but only for the districts that can afford it? And I thought maybe you could just touch on that. Yeah, so no, it's not a big idea that only rich districts can do. I mean, let, let, so if you go to the grocery store yourselves, right, and you buy chicken nuggets, when you think about what a pound of chicken nuggets cost, not even organic chicken nuggets, but just crappy everyday chicken nuggets, on a per pound basis, they're much more expensive than buying raw chicken, right? And cooking it. Now there's some staffing in there and there's certainly training and there could be equipment. But when you look at the basis of scratch cooking, you can actually save so much money on food cost that can help offset potential increases in payroll costs that it doesn't need, you know, every school district doesn't need grants to do it or more money to do it. There's an educational component and an equipment component but under the USDA guidelines in a lot of states as well, there's all kinds of grants to get the equipment. So if you can get the equipment and then get training, and there's all kinds of uh, organizations, including CAF that does training, but ICN and there's USDA, there's all kinds of training that's out there. If you can get your staff trained and get some equipment in place, and it doesn't need to be big, fancy, expensive equipment, you can scratch cook, but it's baby steps. I mean, let me go back to the marinara. Can you cook pasta from scratch instead of buying a frozen pre-cooked pasta? Can you make a marinara sauce with canned USDA commodity tomatoes 
but make it yourself, add some extra ingredients, cook those two things separately, put them together and serve them. Now you have a speed scratch item that's way better than, than make, buying a pre-made frozen pasta dish. And maybe even a more important one would be to talk about is mac and cheese, because a lot of people still buy mac and cheese that's frozen all together in a thing, you know, in a big plastic frozen pouch. But you can cook that pasta. You can make a scratch made uh, mac and cheese sauce that's very easy to make um, and put it together and have a, a speed scratch or scratch item. So those are... everyone can do it. You just have to start with baby steps. Sorry, that's... Eva. No, 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 no worries. That that's great. And and those even those specific examples of those recipes too, and how accessible it is. And I think also highlights this point around the economics behind scratch cooking, you know, this myth busting that you just did in terms of it's not inaccessible. It's not for, you know, districts that have the luxury of additional financing for it. And it takes those extra steps of education, that technical expertise and assistance and that equipment, but it's achievable and the outcome is more nutritious and more delicious, which I can confirm from the cheese sauce because I have tried that. Um, so, so, what, Eva, let me just finish with one thing because sure. what you said is really important. Why scratch cooking is really important to the health of our children is you can, in, you can decide on the individual ingredients. So when you buy a packaged pre-made processed item, there can be in chicken nuggets, 34 ingredients. You could make that, you could make a breaded chicken with two or three or four ingredients. So you can choose what's in it. It doesn't have to have chemicals. It doesn't have to have colors. It doesn't have to have dyes. It doesn't have to have added sugars. You can choose your ingredients and it can have your level of salt. And I think that's what really makes scratch cooking stand out yeah. from a health perspective. Thank you. So down, down with the dino nugget is um, part of the, the conclusion in, in all this. Um, thank you, Chef Ann. And Mara, I want to turn it back to you as sort of, you know, Chef Ann gave us that this context of, of why scratch cooking and sort of the value and re relevance of the Chef Ann Foundation overall. You've been with the organization for 10 plus years. You've seen a lot of internal and external changes and even the function of the foundation and how it supports school food and, and policy changes. What are some of the major wins that um, you're really proud of and that you feel like the organization has really played a role in you know, convening and leading around influencing child nutrition policy? Thanks, Eva. And I think to kind of play off of Anne's response, for me, I feel like over the last three years, the biggest win that I have seen is our ability to help support education with, you know, legislators um, and stakeholders around um, the circular outcomes of scratch cooking. So I feel like, you know, people understood that, oh, scratch, it's great to have a scratch cooked meal, right? You know, I love when my mom's in the kitchen or my dad's in the kitchen and they make me a meal. And that's a great nice, that's a great added value piece. I think one of the things we've been able to help do is to um, uplift the, you know, actual um, connected value to that around um, the improved nutrition, potential nutrition of the meal, when you're able to kind of up-level certain ingredients. So Anne was just talking about scratch-made mac and cheese. You know, when you look at a package of cheese sauce, you know, I've got one, you know, somewhere in the back of my house from Land Lakes. frankly. It's got about 32 ingredients in it, um, half of them or more you would not know. Uh, as opposed to making a cheese sauce from scratch, you're able to really take out a lot of those lower end ingredients and, and deliver an end product to the kids that I think has a higher level of nutrition. So you're able to up level the nutrition, which is, you know, a, a lot of stakeholders and legislators really care about that. You're able to um, better support local economies. So, you know, with, you know, the $14 billion nearly spent on school lunches um, annually in the country, you know, how much of that is being kept in your or state by the districts that are implementing school meals, right? If you are buying a cheese sauce, 
from Land O'Lakes, maybe none of those ingredients are coming from the state in which you live. Um, when you're able to scratch cook and able to procure individual ingredients, you're able to make decisions uh, about what you can buy locally. And that ultimately uh, ends up impacting local economies. And I think local economies is something that resonates with a lot of legislators. Yeah, um, on then, both sides of the, of the aisle too, I think. In, that's in right. I think you... that um, the environment, just the last thing, when you're able to, you know, when you're able to make those particular decisions around key ingredients, you can purchase more sustainable ingredients that um, support environmental outcomes. Yeah, thank you. And again, I, I love that framing too of the, you know, the local and economic resilience is key to, you know, whatever your um, your political alignments are. Um, can you also speak a little to, you had huge success and sort of a best in class model with the Hayes bill. Can you share a little bit more with how the Chef Ann Foundation led that advocacy work and even sort of some, um, some added work around the um, Child Diabetes Act and really starting to get into this counteracting of, of you know, undesirable nutritional outcomes for, for children through a few of these initiatives. Yeah. So, you know, one of the um, issues in the past is that a lot of us kind of smaller organizations that were um, advocating for things like scratch cooking, we didn't have the, we, we kind of didn't have the bigger voices. Um, but in partnership with a, a collective called Scratch Works, the Chefan Foundation was able to um, work to get a um, uh, lead on a bill that was passed in the House, uh, let, and it's called the Scratch Cook Meals for Students Act. And it was led by Congresswoman Hayes out of uh, Connecticut. And it is a bipartisan sponsored bill with uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick out of Pennsylvania being the other co-lead on it. And then um, also a Congresswoman out of California. And this was uh, a bill that provided uh, funding for um, school districts and school food programs to create change and increase scratch cooking. And it was modeled after a program that the Chef Ann Foundation has um implemented since 2016. I see, I, I know there's uh, some Get Schools Cooking districts on this call. I can see them in um, in the registered participants. Um, the Get Schools Cooking program is a three-year program where we work with districts to help them increase their scratch cooking and do some hands-on work with them. And this was modeled after that. So to get something through the house bipartisan on this was a really big win. Um, and, you know, and, and being able to part partner with, um, um, scratch works and and bring this collective together of voices that are trying to improve uh, the meal quality and scratch cooking was really great. Um, also, you know, the Childhood Diabetes Act, one of the interesting things coming out of that is, um, is the the deep look that they want to do into ultra processed food. And this has been something, you know, the term ultra processed food has really, you know, is really starting to emerge. It's something that we've talked about at the Chef Ann Foundation since its onset, you know, for the last 15 years. But, you know, this is something that the Chef Ann Foundation is going to focus its advocacy efforts on over the next five years. You know, if the child nutrition reauthorization um, does get taken up again, which we hope it does, um, you know, looking at ways to reduce ultra processed food uh, in our school food system is, I think, going to be imperative. And then, you know, one of the last pieces that we've really been able to, you know, do is just have this really strong partnership with the USDA, which, you know, has just been an incredible experience. So one of the things that we've done in partnership again with Scratchworks is we've had USDA listening sessions with groups of districts from around the country um, for them to kind of help tell the USDA what kind of changes would need to happen in the commodity food program or the USDA food program to help them increase their scratch cooking. That's great, Mara. And, um, you know, I think teeing up a, a lot of the conversation around the ultra processed is important too, and very inflammatory, maybe no pun intended in terms of, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, varying thoughts and perspectives and in turn financial incentives 
for or and against um, ultra process, which I know um, can complicate the work sometimes. Um, MJ, you've been so patient and, and this was sort of like a perfect um, segue to the work that you do. The fact that, you know, the Chef Ann Foundation now even has a dedicated senior policy and advocacy person to be able to lead this work, I think already is, you know, a major green flag for us in terms of the leadership that the foundation takes. Um, from your perspective, you know, we've talked about sort of the major mechanisms in place around federal policy and, and how, you know, bills sort of move through this more traditional um, series to create impact, but you've done a lot of work and you've seen on the ground um, a lot of policy progress that can happen in some sort of unexpected avenues and still continue to have a pretty outsized impact. So I'd love you to speak to that. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Uh, and just before I start, thanks for everyone for being here. And uh, it's definitely an honor to share a stage with some powerhouse women in the field. So um, yeah, so I think often when we think about policy change, we think about those big ticket items, right? The farm bill, child nutrition reauthorization, a state passing healthy school meals for all. But there's really a lot happening in other channels where advocates can really make an impact. And I want to lift up two examples. One is the federal appropriations process. So Congress, although they don't always do it on time, has to pass a budget each year. And part of that process, you can work with your senator, your member of Congress to secure funding as long as it fits into one of the categories they lay out. Or you can get what's called report language, which can direct a federal agency like USDA to take action. So this year we worked with the congressional office on an appropriations request around school food workforce development, something that we think both USDA and the Department of Labor can really hone in on uh, and make some change. That alone, whether it's report language or an appropriations request, can really get folks to pay more attention to an issue. Maybe you think that's falling a bit under the surface and help you advocate for it. Now, another example is with federal rulemaking. Again, not something that always catches the headlines, although it did last month with USDA, but um, agencies across the federal government publish rules that affect the way that programs operate. So many folks on this webinar, like I said, know that in April, USDA passed um, their final rule on school nutrition standards, updating them. And they actually received over 136,000 comments from people across the country. And what they do is they read all these comments, they summarize them, and then they publish what people said about each part of the rule, the pros, the cons, and kind of their own spin on it. And what this process does, it allows school food professionals the opportunity to offer their comments in writing, as well as the USA held many, many meetings with stakeholders to offer their feedback and what the rule would mean on their programs. So with a lot of this, it's keeping folks up to date on what's happening and opportunities for them to offer their expertise to our government leaders. But the reality is a school food director doesn't have the time to scour the federal register every week, right? Um, but we at the Chef Ann Foundation can help be a conduit, help be a connector. And I think these processes like appropriations or rulemaking uh, becoming more inclusive and less intimidating is really important. Thanks, MJ. And I think, yeah, it really speaks to um, one, the the reality of, you know, school food directors and, and teams on the ground lacking that capacity most of the time, the value of the Chef Ann Foundation to be able to play that conduit role. And also, I think what you're saying, too, is really encouraging and empowering that there is still a lot that can be done in local and state settings. And so, you know, even when things are not moving as they should, as we've discussed on the timelines at the federal level, there's still these um, additional opportunities to really create that change, which I think um, is the optimistic view we should uh, be looking at this. So thank you. Um, Emily, I'd love to turn to you for a second too. In We had talked a lot about the importance of collaboration and breaking down silos within even sort of, you know, our, our government structure. Can you speak a little to some of the, um, the unusual suspects that we've had as champions in some of this work that historically we haven't seen before? Yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, I think a lot of this conversation comes back to just, you know, we talked about like, there's these two bills that regulate, like there's, different federal agencies. We've been talking a lot at the federal level today about the USDA, which is the agency that oversees school meal programs, but also there's the Department of Health and Human Services. And a lot of what we're talking about, of course, has health impacts too. So it's been interesting in this administration in particular, I think, to be trying to zoom out at the like White House level and 
try to put some of these things in dialogue with each other. And I, I think in some ways it's going well. And I think there's some things that are hard. Like we, you know, everyone is in their, is in their sort of silo. They know what they do. They know which bills they look at or, you know, which agency they have to report to. And there's some tricky things, but I want to talk a little about the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, which was held in September of 2022 and um, had a lot of focus, you know, some elements included on schools particularly, which I'll mention, but also just this broader focus on, um, you know, reducing food insecurity and hunger and increasing, um, like, you know, reducing diet related dis disease through more nutritious diets. And so again, a lot of what we're talking about today, like that mission aligns with it. And I think it's, it, it laid out a, a set of things that the White House was sort of committing agencies to do. And then a bunch of things where they said they're going to, they commit to talk to Congress about them. So a couple, like I'll start with a couple that are school related. One was that they really committed to trying to advance a pathway to free healthy school meals for all. So that is in the strategy. Um, you know, it's hard because it's not something that that the White House or USDA or any agency can do on their own without Congress really changing some of the rules. But um, but one aspect of that was another thing USDA did um, recently was increasing eligibility for the, the community eligibility provision, which allows more schools to opt in. And of course, we already talked about a number of states passing healthy school meals for all at the state level. So I think you know, there's there's a commitment from this White House, at least, and from the agencies to try to do what they can to support that. And then I think calling on Congress to take the next steps. Um, there was also, um, you know, elements in there around like expanding summer EBT, which also, you know, is happening. And, you know, that, again, things were committed there that we're now seeing come to fruition. Um, more about other, you know, improvements to nutrition standards and meals. The other big thing to flag, I think, that's relevant here is, is things that are not in school meals and not in USDA, but that will impact all of this. So there's a huge focus on food as medicine, which yeah. a lot of the focus, you know, goes through specific things. And, and again, my center does a lot of work on these topics like um, Medicaid, you know, actually getting health insurance coverage for healthy food for people who are food insecure and have certain um um, diseases or, you know, pro, you know, like diabetes, pre-diabetes, sometimes pregnancy, there's depends on the state, but, um, but there's a lot of those, but there's also just this talking more about like what we eat is so important to our own health. And I think some of that then infuses back to the way we think about schools. And, and I think the best thing we can do is have them be even more in synergy and more in dialogue, but that isn't always so easy. Um, aligned with schools, the FDA, which regulates um, the, you know, a lot of our food supply has really committed to, and that has been working on reducing sodium nationally. So again, like what we're seeing in the new um, school meal nutrition guidelines that MJ just talked about are going to be rolling out more nationally as well. Of course, we can't require changes for people, but the FDA did put out short-term targets for sodium reduction. And this summer, they're going to come out with longer term targets for sodium reduction nationally. So what we're seeing in schools will, will very much align with that. FDA committed to look into added sugar. Again, we're seeing it happen in schools through the school nutrition guide, you know, the, the new the new rules. Um, but FDA also held a summit to talk about how to deal with that. Um, and then also this summer, FDA is going to be coming out with a final rule on what foods are allowed to call themselves healthy, which I think is really helpful. Like there's a lot of things out there that masquerade as healthy, but aren't actually healthy. Um, and they're going to have a draft rule on a kind of broader front of package labeling framework, which, again, you know, these aren't only for schools, but I think they'll also help with some of what we're talking about around making it easier for, um, you know, those like working in kitchens and schools to, to make some sense of like what is good for you, what's not, and make better decisions. And then certainly like the goal is for people to when they leave school, be able to go out and make better decisions too. So hopefully this will put a little more guardrails there. Um, but I think overall, just this like multi-government, multi-agency, multi-stakeholder effort to really reverse course on the way that we're eating. And I think that can only continue to benefit what we're all talking about in making it easier, more possible, more supported in schools.
That's great, Emily. And and thank you for, you know, that that overview and especially around the um, guidelines around really what's marketing, messaging, you know, what's healthy, what's not, because in the States we have no real um, guidelines around, you know, what we can call those things. And I think linking back to the food as medicine movement that we're seeing a lot um, around just sort of like in the greater food space, I think is really important. Um, I just want to take a, a quick pause for everyone who's listening in. I've been seeing all sorts of delightful questions coming in in the chat. Um, if somebody has asked a question that you just love, please go ahead and make sure you upvote it and give it a, a thumbs up um, so that I can um, pick the, the few that we can squeeze in near the end. So take a look at those um, in the meantime. And I want to transition us in, in this moment to the state level policy. And again, this is one of the areas where Chef Ann Foundation has really been leading. Um, I now live in the state of Colorado. And so I've been very excited about the work that Chef Ann has been leading and Healthy School Meals for All that has been sort of, you know, now eight states have this historic opportunity to um, really uh, provide much more accessible food in, um, in, the, in, the, in school uh, food programs. Can you, and, and this is really a question for anyone on the Chef Ann Foundation team, tell us about the example within Colorado. How did, why was that unique? How did we achieve that? And why is it so significant for us in terms of really leveraging that, um, that state level leadership? I think that what's unique about it is it was put to the voters. So this isn't, this wasn't a bill that went through the legislature. In fact, the legislature passed and said they didn't want to take it up and went right to the voters and the voters passed it. Uh, it's a great example of how wonderful things can happen and also how you can trip up. So of the eligible schools in the state, 100% signed up. The response from families and parents was unbelievable. Breakfast increased 37%. Lunch increased 32%. This is overall statewide. But even a bigger impact was that 105%, uh, we saw 105% in breakfast increase of paid students and 62% increase of paid students for lunch. That's huge. So unbelievable great news. All the school districts thought we needed it. Parents thought we needed it. Kids participated and oh, we ran out of money. So on the downside is this was this great idea and it's really needed. And we saw so many working families really needing these programs because the upper limit of, you know, for free and reduced lunch is, can be pretty low when you live in an expensive area. And so, all of that was tremendous. And also in Colorado's bill, there was money for local food procurement. There was money for technical assistance. There was money for increased funding for staffing so that you could pay the, the teams more money and get them more educated and get them scratch cooking. So all of those things were really good. But you know, there's a financial dynamic at play. And so right now in Colorado, some of those additional programming like the technical assistance, local food procurement, some of those things are not being funded at all and some are only being partially funded at least for a year or two uh, while the legislature figures out how it might pay for this. That's great. Thanks, Chef. And um, Mara, anything or, or MJ, anything that you wanted to add to that one as well? No, I mean, I think that the, you know, we're in the beginning stages of the implementation of state-based healthy school meals for all and Colorado being able to pass it by ballot measure, you know, is an opportunity for other states to look at that pathway. Um, and, but we're also seeing, you know, in states across the country that, that have passed this, that it is exceeding uh, the the kind of funding that they proposed within the budget. And, you know, I think us what us advocates have to do is kind of point to the fact that that is because it is needed um, more so than we ever thought. 
uh, you know, with um, the cutoff of, you know, kids who the income cutoff of kids who can receive the free and reduced lunch program, we knew we were missing kids in that in families in that um, in that space. And I think this is just speaking to, you know, how many kids and families were being missed in that space. Um, so I think that's the key takeaway here. I think we have to get over this year, uh, this hump, I call it the hump year a little bit, where the reality of the cost is kind of, you know, coming in at different levels than the states had anticipated. And we have to get through this time. Us advocates have to really get through this time and continue to move it forward in the states. That's great. There's a question that I think uh, either MJ or Emily, you guys, one of you could tackle. And the question is, can you talk about how increasing the multiplier for CEP would help help with universal meal goals and the chances of that happening? MJ, you want to go on that one? I mean, I think what I, I, I can start and then MJ, you jump in. I mean, I think the challenge, like with the chance for that happening, and again, this is, it's a great, I actually wrote that question down, Shefan, because I was like, oh, I want to like look into that more. Because I think often my question is just, I, how much can USDA do that on their own? Or is the, is the multiplier actually in the legislative language? Um, so for example, like USDA on its own was able to reduce the percentage of identified students needed in a school for the school to offer CEP. Um, and I'm not sure if the answer here is that that's also something that the agency can do on its own or if it's written into CNR, which comes back to if it's in CNR, like can Congress do something on that and move it? But but I think it's a really good question. I'm happy to like look into, is it something that um, there's ability for USDA to do on its own? And I think for those who don't know it, this is the amount, um, I guess the amount that schools would receive for those identified students. So it would increase the overall amount and make it easier for more of them to offer, um, you know, universal free meals. MJ, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so uh, when this was happening and USDA was trying to decide like what they could and couldn't do, the big kind of trigger was like what, is the power of the purse, which is where Congress comes in. So they decided that they can um, expand CEP when it comes to the multiplier. That was where kind of the, the buck stopped and Congress needed to act. So uh, for folks that are interested in advocacy around the multiplier, which is really important in making CEP more vi financially viable for school districts, there's the School Meals Expansion Act, uh, which is currently in Congress. Uh, you can call your your representatives to co-sponsor. Um, that's something that the National Healthy School Meals for All Coalition is supporting that Shepan is a part of. So the School Meal Expansion Act um, is, is going through Congress. Definitely encourage folks to sign on. Good. Thank you for that. Um, and we have uh, just a few quick minutes now for a few other questions. So many good ones in the chat, um, which I think just speaks to just how unbelievably passionate and interested everyone is in this work. Um, so I may take it towards, since we have so many different districts um, represented states, um, one of the questions was, what are the best things that parents, students, and school advocates can do besides at the federal and state level to help support their own schools um, to build these uh, both healthy and culturally appropriate meals, which is another um, uh, theme that's come up in the in the chat box here. So I don't know if uh, Chef Ann or, or Mara, um, if either of you want to take that one. I, I, I'll jump in and then Mara uh, tag team with me. But for school districts in states that don't have healthy school meals for all or in states where it's partial like New York, the best thing parents and advocates can do is buy the school meals. Unless we can increase the average daily participation through paid meals, it's really hard to make the meals better. So for every parent that buys school lunch, that's helping support the department that then can help um, uh, that can then support scratch cooking and better staffing and better food costs. But for school districts like Boulder was one that had a low free and reduced population, it was really important for us to get the paid parents to participate. Mara? 
So I was a parent trying to improve school meals in my community in Boulder. Um, I have three kids and I was, you know, when I, um, this is, this was pre chef Anne being the food service director, I will tell you that, but I was very disappointed in the school meals when I was here and, um, out of that experience and, uh, a number of other parent experiences that have tried to change school meals. One of the things that the chef Anne foundation has created is the parent advocacy tool. Kit. And I think the most important thing that I learned when I was trying to increase freshly prepared foods through the district as a parent was that I was going in without enough education about the school meal program. And so the food service team was annoyed in a way at my lack of understanding of what they were up against and kind of what I, you know, what I was asking for. And that was eye opening. And so this toolkit really goes through the process of getting you educated about what, what are all these things? What are all these, you know, pieces that they have to create meals within the guide rails of? Um, so there's all of these education opportunities. And then there's a process of, you know, getting organized, which is another thing, you know, what are you asking for? What are you really trying to work with the district to ask them to do? Because, you know, when you kind of just go in where it's like, you know, we just want better food. Um, it's harder for them to tackle that. And then um, the the last thing is just is um, as the advocating for change and that it really kind of walks you in step by step. So I feel really strongly about um, the first, particularly the first part, which is getting educated uh, about school meal program and um, and then kind of really figuring out what you're asking for. Thanks, Mara. And yeah, what I'm hearing is really making sure to get clear around what specifically that ask is and not just something more and better, but making sure that um, it's more explicit. And thankfully, with the resources that the Chef Ann Foundation has, there's a lot at people's fingertips. Um, I'm pained because we have so many more juicy questions, but I'll I'll give it to the panelists. We have a question that we can go into on the on food waste reduction um, in the farm bill, which Emily had touched on just a little bit, but I know that people are very keen on. Or we can talk quickly about the importance of workforce development and the relationship between the advocacy and promotion of scratch cooking and the upskilling and uh, sort of increased employment opportunities um, for food service operators. So maybe I'll, uh, th those are the two questions I'll let my panelists decide um, which one we're gonna go for in our, in our final word together. I think that we should talk about the second question, but because I don't want to miss the opportunity to advocate, ever the advocate, I'm going to, I put in the answers to the Q&A and I can put in the chat a link to the Zero Food Waste Coalition, which is a coalition that we help lead that has a lot of really good resources for Farm Belt and Beyond. So that was my super quick answer and I would love, to, I'm excited to hear what others say on the other question. Well, I can link the workforce to a question that um, uh, someone named Thomas asked. Would you say there's a relationship between the compensation, not professional development of school food workers and scratch cooking opportunities and outcomes? And I would say there is a direct correlation. So one of the more significant pieces of the system that the Chef Ann Foundation has decided to work on over the last five years is workforce development. And one of the reasons is because you know, um, if we're kind of looking to the future of where we all want to see school food, we have to kind of look to the future to see what is the workforce we need to get there. And that's the kind of looking at this systems approach. And, you know, there are a number of issues within the system of labor of school food. Often they are the lowest paid school food employees um, in the district. That means that that job is valued least within the school district. And I think we have um, a lot of work to do in ensuring that people understand the value of these roles and people understand that the contributions they're making to the district um, through serving healthier food. And so workforce development, 
um, for us, for the Chef Ann Foundation, and a lot of organizations and partners across the country has been a big piece of our work to help get school food professionals um, trained to help recruit more people into the workforce because there is a pretty significant vacancy rate in school food programs right now. And that is causing a lot of this kind of ultra processed food to be served um, when you are down, you know, 13% of your employees. So workforce is important. Thank you. And thank you all so much for this amazing conversation. We are at time for today. Um, and the questions, I, I reassure everyone that literally hundreds of people who are listening in, I assure you, one, this is being recorded. So if you had to jump out at certain moments, we have all of this juicy content available for you very soon. Um, all the resources that were mentioned, including um, Emily mentioning the uh, the uh, Zero Waste Policy Coalition and a variety of the other programs and toolkits and resources that the Chef Ann Foundation has, um, again, sort of at the ready for you, will all be available in um, our follow-up note. Um, but just a huge thank you to the Chef Ann Foundation team and to Emily and everyone who's been listening in today. And um, it certainly gives me hope and encouragement that we are absolutely on the right path. The system change that we need in food is coming and happening and school food is at the center of it. So grateful for everyone's time. Mm -hmm.